So I'll be explaining the endocrine system, which is your hormones essentially, and the uh, uh, nervous system for the most part, at least an overview of both. Um, you know both the quiz obviously, uh, and before I forget, the uh, FRQ this week is actually not, there's not quite enough information on the uh, systems for me to give you an FRQ on that. So it's gonna be uh, you analyzing an experiment. So like, you know, the variables, the ethics, the validity, those sorts of things. So be prepared for that tomorrow. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna go through these. You guys already have the notes for it. Uh, normally, like I said, I like to explain, then you write the notes, but just because of uh, uh, timings this week, we had to do it differently. So I'll explain them to you. Uh, and anything I say that's helpful, thank you. Anything I say that's helpful or helps clarify for you something, just jot it down yourself uh, in the notes that you already have. Uh, if I offer out a question, don't forget, uh, you can raise your hand and answer it and you win some Morgan Bucks. And uh, we'll take a break at roughly, probably around 10, 10, between 10 and 10, 10. We'll see where we're at about there. And then we'll, uh, we'll finish up. If I happen to finish up early, we'll, we'll play a review game or, or something like that. But I don't know. There's a lot to get through, and I, I want you guys to know this stuff. If we don't finish, I'll pick up tomorrow and finish explaining it before the quiz and the FRQ. You guys got that? All right, sweet. So the endocrine system. So we're in Unit 2 now, uh, and the Unit 2 uh, focus is how biology, obviously your body, the hormones and everything in it, uh, determine your development and behavior. All right, so that's what unit two is focused on, as the biological uh, basis of behavior. So there's a bit of nature nurture in here, but again, we know we are well informed now at this point. We don't have all the details, but we definitely know that uh, your behavior and development is absolutely an interaction of both. Uh, maybe it's leaning a little bit more towards one uh, than the other, but there's still it's still a, a both very much impact how you actually develop. All right, so there's no blank slate, but there's also no pure genetic determinism. It's, it's gonna be a blend here. Okay, so we're focusing first on the uh, endocrine system. Endocrine system. So the endocrine system, uh, it's got several organs, uh, which we'll highlight. Um, I think we have like five or six of them. Do we highlight all of them? I can't remember what I have in the notes. Let me look at the picture to make sure I'm not skipping any. I believe it's just the main six or so. So I don't think the hypothalamus is on the test, but I'll, I'll tell you about it a little bit. Okay. So we're talking about your organs and the hormones coming from those organs uh, in parts of your brain, like the pituitary gland. So if this is, I'm gonna draw a terrible human here. So this is a terrible human. All right, and they've got shoulders and arms. I'm not gonna draw appendages. I'm just gonna draw outlines, almost like a shock outline. All right, this guy's got a, he's very fit, apparently. All right, but he didn't, he didn't do leg day. So, um, pituitary gland, that's obviously in your brain. Uh, it's not on the test, but I wanna mention the hypothalamus because it's, it's important. I, I've seen some people include it in the endocrine system, some people not, uh, depending on the website, but I know for sure um, that it, it's, it's influential in excreting hormones, or at least determining which hormones are excreted. So hypothalamus, also part of it. I'm gonna add it to it. Uh, you've got your pancreas, which is roughly in this region. Uh, adrenal glands. Right, and then you've either got, if you're male, you've got the testicles, and if you've got, if you're female, you've got the ovaries. Uh, we're gonna, oh, we'll just put ovaries and testicles. Sometimes they're uh, combined as testes. Because by the way, if you didn't know this, when you're uh, developing, they always start as ovaries. And then if you're a male, uh, and you get a flood of testosterone, and you've got the Y chromosome and all that, uh, they descend and develop into testicles. Um, so, and then of course you have some, I think it's one in a thousand, you have a, an intersex person where uh, they may descend, they may not descend, uh, and, and, it, and it changes some of your, your uh, uh, phenotypical features and some of your behaviors. but. Uh, usually more one than the other, uh, but they're technically intersex. Uh, very small percentage of people, but it happens. All right, um, what else am I forgetting? I'm forgetting at least one. Oh, thyroids, there we go. Is that the only one I'm forgetting? I think so. All right, so those organs all dictate um, production and distribution 
of what we call hormones. So this is the endocrine system, these are the organs that are part of it. There are, there are more or less, but for the AP test, this is all we really care about. Uh, and what we're gonna care most about are these right here, these, these do matter, and I'll talk about why, but, uh, and then we care about these more so than the thyroid pancreas, but, but I will discuss this, okay. So endocrine system, this is all about hormones. And you've all heard of hormones, there's four types. There's proteins, there's lipid-based ones, which are fat molecules, uh, there's steroids, and I forget what the fourth one is. It's irrelevant, it doesn't matter. But they come in slightly different forms, but they all do basically the same thing. These organs either dictate how many are made, uh, to where they're distributed, uh, at what point they're made, et cetera. Uh, and these hormones um, float around in your bloodstream. And that's what really combines all these things and makes them all similar. It's hormones, which are very, very small molecules, like smaller than a cell. Like you, you can't see them. You could look at them in a microscope perhaps, uh, depending on the hormone. Uh, but uh, you, you, you can't visibly see them just like you can't visibly see a cell. Uh, so these hormones are all um, traveling through, they're producing these organs, but they all travel through the uh, bloodstream. And the reason why we point this out is because there's another way your body communicates uh, and determines how you develop, and that's your uh, nervous system. And that one is not through the bloodstream. Uh, does anybody know how that, one, how that one passes through? How that one communicates, your nervous system? Uh, electricity. Not just electricity, you're half right. Um, electric signals through your spinal cord. That's true, we got a half right. Electricity is definitely a part of it, at least a static charge. <coughs> yeah, it's electricity and chemicals, it's both, uh, which we'll talk about, right? So I'll give you the Morgan Bucks for that if I can find my sheet, which is way over here. Okay, that's second period. Bring this over here, obviously. Okay, so the nervous system, which is what we'll talk about next, oops, covering up your work here, uh, which we'll talk about next. I'll, I'll put it over here on the side. Nervous system is uh, communicates through a combination of uh, electric charge uh, and chemicals. So we refer to it as electrochemical because it's definitely both. If you take one out. Uh, the other is not able to communicate by itself, all right? So if it's electrochemical, would you say that communication in the nervous system is fast or slow? It's really fast, right? It's, it's almost instant. As far as you can perceive it, it's instant. If we obviously look at a smaller time, it's not instant. But uh, as far as humans can tell, it goes instantly, all right? Um, hormones produced, secreted, and travel through the bloodstream. Would you say those are going to be as fast as the nervous system? They're definitely slower, right? Because they have to be uh, pushed out. And it, depending on your pulse and blood pressure, it can move more slowly. And obviously the size of your body matters too. Uh, but those are going to travel throughout more slowly. All right? And that's important for, for a couple of reasons. So to simplify it, I think I put in the notes, uh, this is like sending a text message or anything on your phone through any app. It's pretty much instant as long as you both got internet connection. This though is like sending mail, right? That could take a while. Even with the best Amazon, it's still gonna take a few hours. Uh, if you get same day delivery, it's still gonna take a few hours to like package it and send it over and then you get it. All right, but uh, anything that's on your phone, as long as you have internet access or service, it's gonna be nearly instant. So that's kind of a, a metaphor analogy that would, would represent these two, all right? So not only do these messages and signals travel slower, like get there slower, but they also leave slower, so slower uh, arrival and also slower departure. And what I mean by that is, let's say for example, I don't know, you get uh, some sort of hormone therapy, all right? It doesn't even matter what it is, maybe it's for your thyroid or for your uh, sex hormones, which is in the, uh, it's for sex hormones, the uh, more male or masculine hormone is testosterone. The more female or feminine one is estrogen. Whatever hormone therapy you're getting, uh, it's not instant, all right? The doctors will give you either a supplement to take or an injection every two weeks or whatever it is, uh, and they'll always tell you this if it's a hormonal thing. Uh, you're not gonna notice any difference uh, for several weeks or months, all right? Because it takes a long time for those hormones to spread throughout and saturate your body properly. <clears throat> so it can take you know two, three, four, five, six weeks, or it could take two, three, four, five, six months 
for uh, the effects to actually be noticed. All right, so that's what hormones, uh, they take a long time to arrive. Now some of them arrive much more quickly, like adrenaline, for example. That one's pretty fast acting. It wouldn't really help you out if uh, you see a bear and your body initiates adrenaline to run and it takes a week, like, cause you, you'll be eaten, like there's no way. Those are quicker, but uh, some of them take a long time, right? When you hit puberty, for example, and your body starts changing, male or female, uh, and it starts becoming more uh, phenotypically visibly male or female, like that doesn't occur overnight, correct? That takes several years to occur, all right? So it takes a long time for these hormones to actually uh, take effect. Uh, but it also takes a long time for them to go away. So let's say you're on hormone therapy for something. Let's say uh, you need more testosterone or more estrogen or whatever. Uh, you're experiencing some sort of symptoms. Uh, the doctors will tell you, oh, it takes six weeks to set in. If I were to stop it, it's also gonna take about that long to go away uh, for the effects to leave my body. So for my body to get rid of those excess hormones and get back to whatever my natural production level is. All right, so these things can take a long time to uh, take effect, but also to uh, leave. Uh, and it's because they're uh, bloodstream dependent. Okay, so I'm asking for already. How could hormones affect you is the question. And it depends on the hormone. But these are incredibly important when we're talking about how you function. Some of the ways we understand how they affect you and some of the ways we don't understand how they affect you, all right? Because hormones can dictate uh, whether or not you uh, are more likely to have cancer or have cancer or make your cancer worse or better. Uh, they can uh, affect how aggressive you are. So that could be verbally, like how quickly you lash out at somebody or physically how quickly you resort to violence or how angry you get. Um, they can affect uh, your, uh, your sex drive. They can affect how uh, much you grow, how much muscle mass you have, how much body fat you have. They, they control a lot of the features of your physical body and actually how your brain develops uh, and your behavior. So <clears throat> what we'll start with is, well, we'll just look at each one uh, temporarily. Okay, the two most complex ones that I, I could not in this class describe to you everything they do, but I'll give you an idea, are the ones that are in your brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So I'm gonna kind of generalize here. But both these glands are super important. Uh, these ones affect your development throughout your whole life uh, time. So if you have an error, for example, or a, or a, a mutation or a difference, whatever you wanna call it, in your hypothalamus or your pituitary gland, like they're too big or they're too small or, or you know, compared to a, an average person, uh, that's gonna drastically affect how you develop. Uh, because the hormones over time determine what your body's doing, uh, what it specializes in, okay? And I gave you an example, like the first day of class. Do you remember um, what example I gave you for the impact of when you're in the womb, like you're gestating, right? You're, you're already conceived and you're, you're in your mom's uh, your fallopian tubes or, or uterus and you're developing. The presence of more or less testosterone actually changes your brain development and your cognitive abilities. Do you got, anybody remember what that was? Arithmetic. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And it's not even so much just the fact that it's male or female. It's actually the exposure to testosterone in the womb. Now, obviously, males are going to get more exposure uh, on average because uh, that's what their, their genes call for. Um, but if I were to uh, either maybe the mother, for whatever reason, has excess testosterone in there uh, uh, for a girl uh, or, or not enough testosterone there for a male, that'll actually affect how their brain develops in the frontal lobe and that also impacts how well they are able to uh, uh, use spatial intelligence to like mentally flip uh, shapes and things like that and spaces and maps, uh, or uh, whether they're better at uh, arithmetic, so quickly adding, subtracting, remembering numbers like that. Um, and uh, weirdly enough, that's, that's how it works. So these, the presence of these hormones have a major impact on how you develop uh, throughout your life. So focusing on these two, uh, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland specifically the pituitary gland, these ones determine how many, many features of your brain uh, and body grow. Uh, pituitary gland, for example, some people call it the master gland. It doesn't have complete control, but uh, it has a lot of control. This one determines 
uh, along with the hypothalamus, uh, how much you grow essentially. This is the main one, along with the hypothalamus, that dictates how much growth hormone you're exposed to. I think you can guess what growth hormones do. What do you think they do? They make you grow, right? But so if I have more growth hormones, I'm going to probably probably grow, uh, be larger, taller, wider, what are bones bigger, muscles bigger, etc. right? So the presence of those hormones, whether they're high or low amounts, is gonna determine uh, my actual body size across many years, all right? So if I have a damaged or abnormal pituitary gland or hypothalamus, that could affect my overall body size uh, and activity. Um, here's an example. We thought maybe, he doesn't actually have this, we thought my son might have had this uh, disorder, called Prader-Willi syndrome. He doesn't have it, we found out, thankfully. Um, it's where the hypothalamus is uh, abnormally small. So what it does is it creates, it, there's a lot of other things, but I'm just gonna focus on this one. It produces way less uh, growth hormone, or at least tells your body to produce less. So what happens is, and you notice this really quickly uh, in infants, is uh, they develop way more slowly, uh, especially with motor development, and, and cognitive too, but definitely motor development. And it's because uh, the amount of growth hormone you have, especially as a kid, it dictates how quickly and how much muscle mass you have. So as you're trying to crawl and walk and grab things uh, as an infant, going up to a toddler, uh, your muscle mass is really important. Because if you don't have enough and you can't support your own weight, you ain't gonna crawl or walk or it's gonna take way longer for you to. Uh, so uh, kids with this syndrome or anything similar to it, if their uh, hypothalamus is small or not working properly and they're not producing enough growth hormones, they are going to be smaller overall and they'll have less muscle mass, which means they either can't or it's severely delayed their ability to crawl, sit up, walk, et cetera, uh, and, and so forth. So uh, it actually dictates how their muscles uh, develop or don't develop. And they found that it helps them cure it, but it helps to identify this early and give growth hormone injections uh, as early as possible to keep them on like a normal line of development. There's a whole host of other issues, but uh, that's one of them. Fortunately, uh, he doesn't have any of that. He was just a little bit delayed on his uh, physical development, but his, his brain is fine. He's catching up on the physical stuff too, which is great. All right, so uh, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, <coughs> they're probably the most impactful as far as your brain development, motor development, because they can dictate the growth hormones that you have, and they also, to a degree, uh, can tell your other glands how much to produce or not produce. All right, especially the pituitary gland, which is why they call it the uh, master uh, gland. All right, so that's what these guys do. They either produce hormones that affect your brain and physical development, or they tell the other glands uh, how much to produce or not produce. So you with me on that? All right, so if I have an abnormally functioning uh, pituitary or hypothalamus, it's going to cause me to develop differently, whether it's physically, body size, ability, or cognitively in my brain. Like it may underdevelop my frontal lobes, then my reasoning and, and inhibition and uh, uh, abstract thought and, and calculation and planning is it's gonna be worse because it underdevelops my frontal lobe. So it has a major impact on how people uh, develop throughout their life. All right, so that's those two. Any questions about those two? All right. Uh, the uh, other two that don't matter as much, uh, well, they definitely matter if you have a problem with them. Uh, but they don't matter as much regarding your um, uh, behavior and, and abilities. But your pancreas and your thyroid do play a vital role. Like if these things aren't working for, correctly, you could definitely die and, and you're going to have problems in your life. But uh, your pancreas uh, dictates your blood sugar. So uh, people that are born with uh, diabetes, I forget if it's type, I think it's type 1 you're born with. Am I wrong or incorrect about that? Okay. Uh, that means they have a problem with their pancreas. Um, or perhaps their pituitary gland, but either way, they are not properly regulating the amount of sugar that's in the blood, glucose, glucose uh, and you regulate that with insulin. So they're either producing too much or not enough insulin uh, when they take in sugar, so they constantly have to monitor their blood sugar, because uh, if it's too low or too high, it could uh, cause them to be woozy uh, or, or pass out or potentially die, depending on how high or low their blood sugar is. All right, so basically, if I, I go to a donut and it's full of sugar, my pancreas kind of measures how much sugar is in my blood, uh, and it'll increase the amount of insulin. It's like, oh, your blood sugar's spiking because you're eating a bunch of sugar. So it'll increase the amount of insulin I have, uh, which um, 
blocks the use of that glucose, stores some of his body fat, and it regulates it for me. If my pancreas isn't working correctly, it won't respond to that and uh, either cause my blood sugar to be too high or too low. And again, that'll impact um, my lightheadedness, my, uh, my drowsiness, my energy, and it could potentially kill me if it gets too high or, or too low. All right, so those are people that um, have to manage their blood sugar for their whole life. Uh, you can also inflict it on yourself by uh, um, eating poorly and having bad health. Uh, being overweight increases your chance of, of, of having this, of developing type 2 diabetes, I think, which is the one that you develop uh, on your own. Uh, you could develop later in life uh, with uh, either poor diet, poor health, poor choices, or, or, or whatever. Or just environmental things happen. So that's the pancreas. It's pretty much just regulating, so far as I know anyway, uh, your blood sugar. And again, if that's not functioning properly, it's gonna make your life uh, definitely more difficult. You have to constantly prick yourself and, and uh, take insulin or, or eat sugar, uh, depending on the situation. Thyroid, similar. This one regulates your metabolism. Anybody know what metabolism is? Close. It doesn't have to do with digesting as much. Energy management, essentially, all right? So people with a high metabolism, do you think they burn or they store a lot of energy? Burn. They burn a lot of energy, right? So lower metabolism uses less energy. Okay, which one do you think gets me to live longer? High metabolism or low metabolism? High metabolism. No, it's actually low. They found out that uh, creatures with higher metabolisms actually uh, live far less uh, long. Uh, they think it has to do with the, uh, the energy and the uh, replicating of cells and the, the screw-ups in DNA, it accelerates that if it's going faster. But that's actually a major reason why women, on average, live five years longer than males, because males have a higher metabolism uh, on average. Obviously, if I take an individual male, an individual female, just randomly grab two, the female might have a higher metabolism. But mostly, if I took all males and all females got their averages, their mean, uh, males have a higher metabolism, and that contributes to uh, earlier deaths for males, generally speaking. That and the fact that males have like more dangerous jobs and they're more likely to be killed uh, through a violent means, stuff like that. But uh, if you're just looking at biological, uh, meta higher metabolism usually means earlier life. And that actually goes across species too. They found that out, like so tortoises live a really long time. Uh, it's because they have lower metabolisms. Um, whales, I think, have pretty low metabolisms. Uh, elephants as well. Uh, and then ones that have really fast ones, like mice, they, they don't live long at all. Insects, most insects, super high metabolisms, super short lifespan, right? Uh, and that's, that's kind of a correlation there. Probably a causal. Okay, so that's what those, those two do. So obviously if I've got a thyroid issue, uh, like let's say it's not properly managing my metabolism, it could cause me to gain a bunch of weight much more easily than somebody else. Because if I'm somebody with low metabolism because my thyroid's malfunctioning and I eat 2,000 calories, but my body, let's say, I have a malfunctioning thyroid or whatever, it only burns 800 calories a day. I have a really low metabolism. What's gonna happen every single day? It's gonna be stored. Yeah, I'm gonna have 1,200 extra calories every single day. And I think it's roughly, is one pound of body fat 3,000 calories? No, I can't be right. I can't remember how much it, it equates to, but if I have an excess of plus 1,200 every day, and I do that for four or five years, that's going to be a lot of extra body fat, all right? And then on the reverse, people with really high metabolisms, let's say, uh, 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 like for example, in my family, we have really high metabolisms for whatever reason, so I'm probably gonna die sooner than most of you, but that's all right. Because um, <laughs> my, my metabolism is gonna cause my DNA to screw up at a sooner rate and I'll die at a younger age than you guys will. So I'll die at 77 instead of 84, watch out. Um, but anyways, <laughs> uh, what, what happens is uh, if somebody's eating 2,000 calories a day, let's say, but they have really high metabolism and it burns uh, their body naturally, it's just the stuff it does by their eye twitches, their talking, their moving, their heart rate, their, uh, their activity, that's your metabolism essentially. Uh, they burn 2,200 calories a day. What's gonna happen on average? Well, what happens on this day? I ate 2,000 calories, but I burned 2,200. I burned 200 calories, right? So every day, if I do this, obviously I don't eat 2,000 calories every day, but if I average this, on average, I'm gonna lose a tiny bit of weight every day. So these people uh, generally have lower body weights uh, because their body naturally burns more uh, than others. And it's weird too, and your body can change this, by the way, and your thyroid plays a big role. So let's, most of us, 
have more food than we can eat. Like you can go get food very cheaply uh, if you wanted to. I think they've done the numbers. If you wanted to eat as cheap as possible, uh, excluding getting free food from, um, you know, like homeless shelters and things like that. If you wanted to buy your own food, uh, you can do it on like, uh, it's like just over a dollar a day, depending on what you're buying. Or it was just over $2 a day. It's really cheap, whatever it is. So most of us have access to more food than we actually need to eat, obviously. All right? But let's pretend I was like, I don't know, on a trip in the mountains. And uh, I'm like hiking with uh, my girlfriend or my boyfriend or whatever I have. And I'm out there, and, and I'm out there for uh, two weeks, but um, one of us gets hurt. We break our leg, and we can't move. And we, all, we gotta stay here until my leg heals so we can get out. And we're too far away, there's no phones, there's no people around, we're like way out there. Um, and do I have more food around me than I can, uh, than I can handle? No, I'm gonna go find some, and I'm probably not super good at it, uh, and I'm in the mountains, and there's probably not a whole lot of it. So, what my body automatically does is, if for a couple days I'm getting way less calories, my body slows down my metabolism. I don't mean just me, by the way, I mean all humans. So let's say, for example, you get stuck out there and there's less food available. Your body kind of measures that uh, as you're going. So it's like, whoa, 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 we've not been getting much food for the last couple days. Clearly, we're starving for some reason. So what your body will do is, uh, and different things will interact, with one of them is your thyroid, uh, it'll actually drop your metabolism. So it'll cause you to burn less calories every day. And what I mean by that is you'll actually do less things. Is that why like dieting, like fasting, and like not eating for a few days and just drinking water is bad for you? Uh, it could be, potentially. Uh, you, you generally don't want to, if you're gonna lose weight and you wanna keep it off, or gain weight and keep it, you don't want to do these major spikes. Because you, you'll sort of fool your body <clears throat> into thinking, oh, I'm starving. So like, let's say you do that. You like go like, no calories for seven days. You're, you're gonna make your body think you're actually starving. So what it'll do is it'll basically shut down a lot of the uh, things you don't need to do. It, it is so weird. It, it'll do everything it can to save as much energy as possible. Like your body's pretty smart, actually. So if you did that for however many days, you fasted, you'll lose less weight than you could have if uh, you, you made it optimal. Here's what I mean by that. So let's say I am fasting for 40 days or 30 days or whatever, or seven or whatever I'm doing. Um, your body will be like, well, we're not getting any food, so we gotta really shut down how much uh, uh, fuel energy we're using. So they've done studies, you'll move less, you'll twitch less. If you normally sit there and tap your foot, your body will automatically make you not want to tap your foot. Uh, your body will make you want to get up less. Uh, you will actually uh, breathe slower, your heart will beat slower, um, you will blink less, it'll save money on, or save energy on blinking. Um, all of the processes in your body that normally go to building and breaking things down, those will all slow down. So your body will use your muscles less. They'll break down your muscles more to extract energy if they need to. Uh, so uh, it'll save as much of the body fat as it can, actually, if it thinks it's starving. Uh, so if you, if you try to like shock your body to losing weight, yeah, you'll lose some weight. You'll lose a lot of weight. You'll also lose a lot of muscle mass. Uh, and then when your body goes back to normal, like, oh, thank God, we're back to normal. And it'll just like stock up because it thinks you got food again and it'll store as much as it can. And what we find out is most people that try to lose weight like that, they'll lose the weight initially, and then they gain it back and more. Because once your body gets the food back, it's like, oh, thank God, we're not starving. Quick store as much of it as we can, so if we starve again, uh, that we will be okay. And then you end up gaining more weight. So that uh, causes you to want more food than you normally would, and, and it goes back up. So if you're wondering the best way if you're trying to lose weight, the best way to do it is to do it incrementally, slowly. So you try to figure out what you burn each day and go a little bit below it. So I don't know, let's say you burn, you, you burn 2,000 a day. You probably wanna do something more like, oh, I'm only gonna have 1,600 calories a day or 1,500. So it's a small deficit. So your body doesn't think you're starving. Uh, and you also wanna to exercise too um, because, we're getting really intricate here. You wanna to exercise too uh, because if you break down your muscle, which is what exercise is, you're, you're actually using your muscles to the point that they can't handle it anymore, and they start actually having these little micro tears, and that's why if you go to the gym and you do a bunch of uh, bench press or squats, you're sore the next day, uh, you actually broke a little bit of your muscle fibers. So your body goes, oh, we use those a lot, let's make them stronger. So instead of building back exactly the same, they add a little bit more to your muscle fibers, the ones that broke anyway. Uh, and you do that over a lot of days. Uh, so if you do that, you keep your body thinking 
that uh, you're okay. It, it actually builds up a little bit more. So you're losing body fat and you keep building muscle so your body thinks you need to build up more. So that way when your diet's done, your body looks at your muscle masses, oh, we're fine, we weren't starving. Uh, my muscle mass is actually bigger. I could actually probably chill out if I want to. But if you just went on starve mode and didn't exercise and your body used a lot of muscle tissue to try to live, it's gonna be like, oh God, we gotta put this all back. You should be really hungry. And then it activates uh, the hormones that make you hungry. Uh, and then you eat way more than you normally would. So, do you guys remember that show? I can't remember what it's called. Extreme Weight, what, no. Not Weight Watchers. No, that's just the program. There's a show, Biggest, Biggest Losers. Biggest Losers, yeah, thank you. Those guys lose a ton of weight super fast because that's what they're supposed to for the show. But guess what happens to almost every single one of them? They don't just get it back to gain more than they initially had because they tricked their body into thinking they were starving. They lose a bunch of muscle mass, so when they're done, their body's like, oh God, we've got to stock back up. So it immediately activates all of the glands that make you feel hungry and you eat more than you normally would. But if you lose it at a slow rate and you work out the whole time and your, and your body's overall muscle mass doesn't drop or it increases, your body won't think you're starving. So it won't make you more hungry uh, when you're done dieting. So you'll, you'll stay, you're much more likely to stay at the weight that you want, whether it's higher or lower. Most people want lower, but some people want to get higher uh, body weights. Anyways, um, but that is, it's not irrelevant because that is all related to, uh, to hormone regulation. All right, and that's how uh, your metabolism works, and that's how uh, your body weight uh, kind of manages itself. All right, so that's the thyroids, that's the pancreas. Adrenal glands, these ones are actually quite important uh, as well. Anybody know what adrenal glands are for? Obviously, secretes adrenaline and norepinephrine, but what do those do? It activates your fight, fight or flight. So if you're in a situation where, um, you know, like a bear, like you said, you can run and you'll be faster than you normally are. Right, it doesn't mean you'll be faster than the bear, but yeah, I would be uh, more energetic and faster than um, I normally would. By the way, it doesn't just make your muscles more energetic and faster. Your actual brain works faster when you're in that state. You actually uh, um, register decisions and, and uh, neural connections more quickly. So uh, if you're ever in a situation where like, um, let's say you're in an emergency, like uh, God, my wife is just terrified of this happening. Every time we go over a bridge, she talks about it. She's terrified that like the bridge is gonna collapse, we're gonna go over the edge and then she'll be in this car trapped and the car will be sinking. Uh, she'll have to get the kids out, like she's, she's terrified of all these things. Every time people get in an actual situation like that, they always report the same thing. They, they say either one of two things. Either it took a long time, when it didn't, it only took like 20 seconds, or they, they say the time slows down, because it kind of does. Anybody have an explanation for that one? Why in an emergency situation would things feel longer, or would time seem slower? It is, it's because you're perceiving and working so much faster. So it's actually only taking the same amount of seconds, but you're processing information way more quickly. So it normally would feel like 20 seconds of, of information coming in and you act to make decisions. You do it so much more quickly. It's still 20 seconds, but you did twice as much. So it feels at least twice as long, right? So any of those times you were like terrified of being found at hide and seek or something like that, and like you're like, oh God, I don't want to be found or, or whatever. Um, uh, or you're actually terrified because you're afraid of something, um, it feels like you're waiting there forever uh, because you're actually uh, registering information and processing it more quickly. All right, so any situation where you see a bear or your car goes off a bridge or whatever, it's gonna seem like forever when it's actually just usually seconds, uh, but you perceive it more quickly. So anyways, these are really important. And evolution has installed this in pretty much all animals, all right, because the animals that had this lived and the animals that didn't have this died. So you kind of gave me an explanation, or at least the beginning of an explanation. Why would um, natural selection and evolution cause almost all animals to have these adrenal glands and this adrenaline response? How does that make me more likely to survive than if I didn't have it? Let's pretend I was born without it. Why, why, would I, why am I more likely to die than somebody who has it? Okay, in an emergency situation, certainly possible. Yeah, absolutely, so I wouldn't be able to act as quickly. The only problem is also when you're scared, you 
sometimes lose your actual thinking brain, the frontal lobe, so you can't really make decisions very well. Which is why, by the way, if you've ever wondered why you go up to like make a speech and you like know the stuff really well, but you're nervous and you're scared and then you forget all of it, you didn't actually forget it. It's just like your frontal lobe kind of shut off and you went fight or flight. So your body's like, okay, we're going to die. You're not going to die. Just like, it's like, we're, we're going to die. So we got to run or we got to fight this thing. And then you're like frontal lobe doesn't get the uh, attention and energy needs. It all goes to your limbic system and, and you forget all the crap you were going to say because you're panicking. All right. That's a real sensation, by the way. So yeah, that's part of it. But why? Why would adrenaline make me more likely to uh, uh, live a longer life than not having it. Because keep in mind what it does. If I see something that I'm afraid of or there's an emergency situation, I instantly get this ready to go energy that allows me to either uh, run, get, get away, or, or fight this thing, whatever the choice is. Right? You always have those two choices essentially. If there's an actual threat you're either like, best option is to A, run from this thing because it's far away or you can't fight it anyway. Like I can't fight a bear, it's gonna kill me unless I have a, a, a weapon, right? Um, or you have to fight it. Like in the case of, oh, your infant's there and there's a bear. It's like, well, I can't run from my infant. I gotta try to fight this thing or draw it away or whatever. Why would that make me more likely to live than not live? Because that's what's happened. All the animals that didn't have this, they're gone. The only ones that are left are the ones that have adrenaline glands and use adrenaline. It can't be that hard to tell me how that would make me more likely to live. You can do it. I believe in you. Those of you who are terrified to have a wrong answer. <laughs> I don't want anyone to think I don't know. I'll sit up here. The internet and I will wait. <laughs> You're most likely to get out of um, bad situations. You are, you are slightly more likely to get out of those situations, right? Um, and that, that's happened before. I, I can think of uh, several times in my life where like, uh, you know, when I was younger and stupider, you would, uh, uh, you know, like junior high especially, um, you would like, uh, you'd have these little scuffles with uh, other guys. It's almost always guys when it's physical. That's a truism, by the way. Uh, it, almost all physical violence is, is male on male. Um, women have a much different way of being aggressive, we'll talk about that later. It's, it's relational. <laughs> um, and again, some women you choose the violence route, and some men choose the relational route. But by and large, men choose physical confrontation uh, uh, when 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 faced with a, an aggressive situation. So, anyways, um, you know, when I was stupider and younger in junior high, um, and you are stupider and younger when you're in junior high because uh, your brain's not fully developed. But uh, I can remember specific situations where I get an argument with somebody or a scuffle, and uh, even if we didn't actually end up fighting. Um, afterwards, like I'd get into an argument or maybe we'd shove each other or whatever. And I'm not saying, by the way, that's the proper thing to do. I just, that's what I did in junior high sometimes, just like a lot of guys do. Um, and then you become an adult and you don't do it as much or you don't do it at all. Um, when I was done, uh, did I just feel normal? Do you think? Like I get in my little scuffle, we'd shove, people break us up, we'd stop, whatever. And it wouldn't just be like a big, okay, I'm going to go to class. And I'd be like the same. Any idea what would be different in me? How I felt and thought and saw things? Uh, you'd still be pretty crushed. I actually wasn't mad. I, I don't remember feeling mad, per, per se. Like like, uh... I had this lingering excess energy is what I would have. So like, um, for example, I remember one specific time my hand was shaking, and, and you can have that for, for fear, but usually when that's happening, it's actually adrenaline. Like you have this excess energy, and it's just ready to be used and, and go. So even though the whole thing's done and I've walked away, uh, I still have this like excess energy. I feel like super um, uh, aroused, meaning like I'm really, really aware of what's going on. My attention is like at 100%. Um, I, I feel like I could run or jump or lift something much heavier than I actually could. That would actually linger uh, for a while. You could if you're experienced the uh, adrenaline rush. Yeah, because your your adrenaline uh, glands are stupid. They don't know what things actually are. Like again, I gave you the example of, of giving a speech. Like you're not gonna die giving a speech to people, right? But your brain, your adrenal glands, and your brain, your limbic system, which is what connects with this, uh, it doesn't know the difference between a lion and a bunch of people judging you. All right. So your brain responds the same way to both. To a lion. It's a great thing to be uh, have extra strength or speed when trying to run or fight. And you're probably not going to win unless you have a tool or multiple people, but it still helps you. It doesn't help you at all if you're trying to remember things and talk to people, 
All right, so your brain, so maybe you're on a roller coaster, you're having fun, but maybe you're afraid, uh, you'll get a shot of adrenaline. That doesn't help you on a roller coaster at all, but your brain, your limbic system doesn't know that. It just goes, oh, I'm scared. Ah, here's some adrenaline. We gotta get away from this thing or fight it. It's like, well, I can't, I'm locked in and it's metal and I can't fight it or run from it, but uh, your brain doesn't know that. So yeah, that's why you can get off and still be shaking or, or, or excited. But uh, some people who have more uh, dopamine receptors, which is the thing that makes you feel happy, excited, and energetic and things like that. Uh, some people who have more dopamine receptors, when they get these adrenaline shots, they get a really positive feeling with it. So they'll get off that roller coaster, like, oh, that was so fun, and they're all energetic, and they're, and they're all jumpy, and they're jittery, um, but in a good way. Those are what you call adrenaline junkies. Those are the guys that uh, like jumping out of planes and uh, uh, rock climbing with no ropes and that, that kind of stuff, because that actually makes them feel excited and good and alive and all that stuff. But it's still related to this, uh, the adrenal glands, because again, when threats pose themselves to older organisms, even before humans existed, that helped you live. For, that, for those few feet, you got extra to run to that river to jump and hide from that mountain lion who's not gonna go in the river after you, or uh, to scare off or fight off a similarly sized other primate or, or predator or, or whatever. It gave you just enough of an advantage uh, to uh, live and have kids and protect those kids, and then the ones that didn't have this, uh, they died off because uh, threats would uh, defeat them, essentially. They didn't have that surge of energy to run just enough to get away or to fight just enough to prevent themselves from dying or whatever, uh, so they went. But again, that's a really old part of our brain uh, that, that's initiated by an old part of our brain that doesn't know the difference between threats, it just knows threat. Threat or not threat? Threat, oh God, here's adrenaline. But it doesn't know lion, people talking to me, roller coaster, it has no way to differentiate. It just goes, ah, threat, and it gives you adrenaline, or not, all right? Um, one thing I can say, too, before we take a break here in a second, is the brain works differently than you think uh, regarding hormones and everything. It's not like your brain's this thing that just functions like a single unit and just produces thoughts and memories and things like that. It's much more complex than that. So instead of thinking of your brain as being one thing, it's actually a whole bunch of things put together that interact, and they can interact both ways. And here's what I mean. I don't know if I'm making sense with this, but you know, some people think of like, there's my brain. That's what I think with and do all these things with. But actually, your brain's more like subcomponents and layers. Uh, and in fact, usually going down towards your spinal cord, generally speaking, that part of your brain is older. And I don't mean like you developed it first when you're in your womb, your mom's womb. I mean like older animals, like further back in time, developed those. Um, so what I mean by that is like uh, your brain stem, medulla and all the parts there, the uh, particular formation, all that, that's in almost all animals. Almost all of them have it. Uh, in fact, they might all have it, but I, I don't know every single animal's brain anatomy, so I can't say that. But I know more animals have these things then don't, and we all have it in common with them. And as you add layers to this, and you go up and you add uh, the thalamus, hypothalamus, and the limbic system and all that, more animals have that uh, in common than don't, because these things appear like, oh, I'm gonna make the years up here. Let's say these all appeared in uh, 100 million years ago, right? And then we had some divergence between species and some developed these limbic systems that helped them develop emotions which helped them live because they could analyze if things were dangerous or not more quickly. Uh, so they got a limbic system 50 million years ago. Uh, and then uh, uh, certain uh, species branched off like primates and it developed these uh, cortical regions which you guys had to learn for the brain. Um, uh, regions like your, uh, like your sensory and your optical and your uh, temporal lobes and parietal lobes and all those. That was uh, much later. And this frontal cortex here, that's the latest addition to the human brain. So less animals have that uh, uh, frontal lobe. So as you go back in, in, in evolutionary history, this stuff, the further you go away from the spine, is basically newer stuff uh, for species. So if I go back to lizards, they don't have a lot of this stuff. right? Because lizards are really old uh, in uh, evolutionary time. Humans are super new. Primates are super new, so they have a lot of new features that we get that uh, other animals uh, don't get. So what that means is my brain doesn't just do things by itself. All of these little layers 
have their own little roles, and they all communicate with different parts of the brain. All right, so depending on if I have damage or not to parts of my brain, or if uh, parts of them are bigger or smaller, or they develop certain ways, or quicker or faster or slower, that's gonna affect the way my brain talks to itself and makes decisions. Uh, and that's gonna affect how I behave, how quickly I figure things out, how I problem solve, how I talk or don't talk, uh, uh, what things I like or I don't like, uh, what things I feel or don't feel or see or don't see. Uh, it's all these little portions interacting together. Uh, so it's not like you have this one brain. It's like you have a whole bunch of tiny little substructures that all communicate with each other in some way, shape, or form uh, to equal what you do and see and feel and, and how you behave. All right, so it's, it's way, way, way more complex than we ever thought. Like your heart just does one thing. It just pumps. Your brain does like just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things, and they all communicate with each other really quickly to equal what you do. And it seems like it's one thing just going, but it's actually a whole bunch of tiny things all communicating with each other. All right, so like for example, um, your amygdala, which is where a lot of your fear and aggression comes from, it's not all by itself. It doesn't just act on its own. It might send signals for fear or aggression, but it also talks to your frontal lobe here. There's some back and forth. So it might be like, oh, you're angry. You want to hit that person. Screw that person for calling you that name. Hit them or call them a name. But it doesn't just command your body by itself. First, it communicates with part of your frontal lobe. And your frontal lobe, depending on how developed it is or strong it is or, or utilized it is, can be like, whoa, 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 let's not punch that guy right now. That's your boss, you'll get fired. Uh, it'll ruin your life. Or that's your, your, your husband or your wife. You're gonna ruin your life and get divorced. Or, or that's a much bigger guy, that's a terrible decision. He's just gonna crush you if you try to, like, that's where your frontal lobe kind of interacts with them and causes you to feel like you want to hit him, but you like you don't hit him because it's a bad idea, you know. Or if you're underdeveloped here or whatever, and your your frontal lobe's not connected properly, uh, or, or like I said, there's a lack of development there, it's not going to do a very good job. And like, whoa, 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 amygdala, chill out. Let's not hit that guy. It's a bad idea. So that makes that person more likely to hit a guy. And you'll never guess what most people in prison uh, have uh, underdeveloped. Most of them have. Uh, less active or underdeveloped frontal lobes because they get that impulse to hit somebody and there's one part of their brain that's much less likely to put the brakes on it. So they're more likely to hit people and they're more likely to be violent and they're more likely to go end up in jail for violent crime. All right, so that's a really simple version of it, but all these parts of your brain, they communicate with one another to actually make decisions and think and like things or dislike things. So it's, it is so insanely complex, we don't even understand it fully yet, but we're getting uh, closer and closer to figuring out how human behavior works. All right, so that's why I mentioned that about the, uh, the, the various brain parts, because it's what you actually do, there are so many factors that go into it, um, from what you think to what you like, to what you do, uh, et cetera. All right, uh, take a break, we'll pick up after that. Now that, uh, hopefully, you kind of understand that uh, your brain's not one thing, not only is it two hemispheres, which we'll talk about later, but it's a bunch of tiny little substructures and parts that communicate with one another, and uh, depending on how developed they are or strong they are, uh, at least their signals, uh, can determine what you think and do and behave and like and all that stuff. All right, um, so here's where the hormones uh, come into uh, uh, play, I would say, uh, with your brain at least, excluding physical features, which hormones also affect. Uh, let's talk just about the brain for a second. So. Um, uh, the adrenaline, I might, I might come back to that, let's, let's put that aside. Let's talk about the uh, sex hormones. Because this helps explain a lot of the uh, behavioral and uh, interest uh, differences between uh, males and females. All right, I, I don't know enough about intersex people uh, to, to give you a good answer on this, but I know at least about the typical um, uh, binary male-female uh, to give you some insight. So, brain develops for, it, about 25 years-ish, like to your mid-20s. Most uh, rapidly, obviously, when you're gestating and your mother, uh, and then it slowly, it slows down as you get older. But nonetheless, it's still developing the whole time. Um, hormones actually have a major impact on how your brain develops, and, and here's roughly how. And it applies to the rest of the parts of your body too, uh, but we'll focus on just the brain for now. So here's how hormones actually do that. So um, your genes, uh, in your DNA, right? You all know what DNA is, that double helix thing with all the uh, um, uh, parts that essentially are your blueprint as a human being. 
Uh, you get half from your mother, half from your father. I think you guys know that, right? It's pretty standard all at this point. Okay, cool. So if you look at your DNA, um, it has different expressions uh, or alleles uh, in it. And if you look on a chromosome, it actually has genes. Uh, I should have said genes, actually. Genes that form uh, to make alleles. So this, this DNA wraps up, and it roughly forms the uh, uh, blueprint structure of your chromosomes. All right, so your chromosomes aren't just like these. This is an X chromosome. Uh, males have one, uh, females have two uh, in each cell. And um, what, what happens is uh, it's broken up into little parts. So it's not just like an X, like a blob that does something. Uh, the genes in it are little tiny fragments um, that go up the entire chromosome itself, right? And then of course the males, they got the Y. I think the Y is actually smaller. I can't remember exactly, but it's the same idea, right? So that would be a male right there. Uh, this would be a female uh, without this. And then intersex, I believe, is those three. It's XXY, which is why it ends up being different, or kind of in the middle, or however. All right, so uh, male, female, intersex. What these hormones do <clears throat> is uh, the presence or absence of these hormones uh, can affect which of these genes are turned off or on. All right, and genes are super complex. I think we got 34,000 or 30,000 or something like that for human beings or 35, something around there. But it's more than that because it's not just like you have 35,000 buttons that do something or don't. It's more like, oh, I've got 35,000, but if this one's on, then this one's on. But if this one's on and this one's on, they turn this one on. Like, there's all kinds of interactions. So it's way more than 35,000 things that happen with these genes. All right, and hormones can dictate what's turned on and off and activated or not activated or, or, or increase the amount of things they produce or, or whatever. All right, so those, those hormones will float through your bloodstream, all right, and they're, they're a certain shape, okay, because they're, they're made of molecules, so they're a certain shape. So let's just pretend testosterone is shaped like this, all right? That's not how it's shaped, but let's just pretend that's how it's shaped. So on these cells, they have receptors for testosterone, and they're shaped just the same way because you can plug them together like a puzzle. All right, so let's say there's a testosterone receptor. And I'm oversimplifying here, but I just wanna get the point across. So it's just sitting there. It's not doing anything, all right? So uh, a molecule of testosterone floats on by and uh, it fits in there. Yay, connection made. All right, and that sends a signal and uh, can tell your genes, the alleles in them, uh, to activate or deactivate or pause or, or whatever it is. Uh, so it can actually turn on and off different genes to the point that, uh, and you've got, by the way, a bunch of receptors all over your cells. So you have a whole bunch of these receptors, all right? So if I have a whole lot of testosterone and I fill up all these receptors, like I'm getting a whole bunch in the womb or I'm a male or, or, I'm, or I'm a female or anybody that's getting testosterone injections as I'm growing up, uh, if I fill more of these, it can send different signals and tell different genes to turn on or off. And that affects how I develop, all right? So the presence of you know, a lot of testosterone or not a lot of testosterone or a lot of estrogen or not a lot of estrogen or any of the other hormones, they can actually dictate what your blueprint does, all right? So if you were uh, born a, an XY and you were, uh, uh, for whatever reason, like your mom just didn't have a lot of testosterone in the womb or uh, your genes produce less testosterone because by the way your genes can determine how much this testosterone is floating in your bloodstream which then changes those genes depending on how many are in the bloodstream whether it's genetic or environmental uh, the presence of this testosterone whether it's a lot or less can tell it to do different things or not so if I only have a little bit of testosterone it's telling my genes to do different things all right so it's like oh grow this part of your brain more or grow this part of your brain less. Or, oh, hey, tell your pituitary gland to increase your growth hormone so you have more body hair and muscle mass, all right? That's what a lot of testosterone will do. So if I got a biological female, I give her a bunch of testosterone, she's gonna gain more muscle mass and more body hair uh, over time. Because that's what the testosterone is doing. It's activating a whole bunch of these receptors. Those receptors are saying, hey, make more muscle mass, all right? Your pituitary gland secretes more uh, growth hormone and you get more body hair, more muscle mass. So that's, that's how it works, essentially. All right, and again, I am oversimplifying, but that's essentially 
what's going on here. And so there's just so many different combinations of things that can happen, depending on how much testosterone estrogen you do or don't get, how long it's there, uh, what genes or alleles it activates or deactivates, right? And that drastically impacts you as a human as you're developing physically or cognitively as to what your body does, right? Because more testosterone will tell your body to produce uh, more growth hormones uh, for your pituitary gland or whichever part of your brain's handling that. Or the presence of more testosterone uh, will activate different um, receptors, more of them, which will change your gene expression, turn certain parts on and certain parts off. And then your body, as it's growing up, it develops uh, more so the part of your brain that's responsible for spatial intelligence, right? Which is why, in general, males can flip this, uh, the uh, shape better in their head and things like that. Or flip it, if you have less testosterone or estrogen, it's telling your brain to build itself a different way. It's telling it, oh, we'll turn these ones off and turn these ones on. And now we're not going to develop this part of the brain more. We're going to develop this part of the brain more, which handles your arithmetic or, or, or whatever, right? Which is why, you know, females might on average have better memory or add and subtract things in their head better than males kind of quicker. Uh, and that helps explain a lot of those things, all right? <clears throat> so what these do over time is that can affect how your brain develops, and that affects every part of you from uh, how your uh, body develops uh, to the things you are more likely to like or dislike. For example, uh, uh, men or things that are exposed to more testosterone are more likely to uh, 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 like things that have less to do with people and more to do with abstract rule systems or machines and tools, you know, like building bridges, engineering, things like that. Uh, but if you lack that, you have more testosterone or estrogen, you're more likely to like things that deal with people, right? Like teaching people or raising people or taking care of people or figuring out people work, that sort of stuff, all right? And that's, that's a really long process because that's just many, many months and weeks and months and years of uh, more or less testosterone or estrogen activating different receptors, telling your genes to turn on or off, and then increasing or decreasing the production or development of certain parts of your brain. So it's super complex and it takes a super long time, but that's essentially how these things actually work. Um, so that's why you can technically, synthetically, you know, inject people, uh, and over time that'll actually change uh, if they're growing up, how their brain develops, how their body develops or shows itself, uh, or whatever. That's how steroids work, right? Because your, your, your uh, cells have all got growth hormone receptors, so if I want to get, get yoked, <clears throat> I could take anabolic steroids, which puts a whole bunch more growth hormones into my uh, body, which activates more of these growth hormone receptors, which tell my, uh, tell my genes to do what? Stay the same? Change? What do they do? Change. Changes them, right? It activates whatever gene combination builds more muscle, right? And deactivates the ones that don't. And then over time, my muscles get bigger. Like you'll actually get bigger from just taking anabolic steroids and not working out than somebody who works out and doesn't take anabolic steroids. Just because your body goes, oh, it looks at its DNA and the genes are actually like, we got to build more of this muscle mass. So they just build more muscle mass even if you don't lift a weight. Right, you just take a bunch of steroids. Right, there's other things too that'll happen, like you'll get acne and body hair, and um, the presence of more testosterone for whatever reason uh, makes you more aggressive. So you use less of the frontal lobe and more of the uh, amygdala, uh, and you end up becoming more likely to lash out or use physical violence or, or whatever. But uh, these are how hormones can dictate how you develop as a person. And again, I mean physically and cognitively. And that's how it actually works on the uh, uh, genetic uh, cellular, cellular level. And I'm not, an, I'm not an endocrinologist, which is a hormone specialist. I'm not a geneticist. I couldn't tell you every detail, but this is roughly how it works. You've got receptors on the cells. The presence of these hormones in high or low amounts or over a long period of time or short period of time can actually change your gene expression and change how your brain develops, how your body develops. All right, does that make sense? Are you with me on that? All right, cool. So just know this, and they've, this is testable. Like this has run the gauntlet through many, many, many uh, genetic tests where they, they can control these things. They can say, all right, let's take uh, mice or humans or chimps or whatever, and let's give them more testosterone or more estrogen or less testosterone or less estrogen and see what happens. And they find a lot of common developments occur. Uh, and that's how they find out that these things are, are linked, essentially. All right, so here's an example for uh, uh, sex hormones. Um, they took, and this is in another note page later, I think, but I'm going to reference it now. 
uh, they wanted to see the link between aggression and testosterone because they had a theory like, oh, look, for some reason, all these guys in prison have really high testosterone uh, and all these really aggressive dogs have high testosterone. How could I find out if testosterone is the reason why they are more aggressive? How could I test that? So I have a theory, right? I'm like, oh, look, there's a correlation here. Let's look at uh, how likely a person or a dog or whatever is to be violent. A 10 is like they're super violent. A zero is they won't ever harm you no matter what. Uh, and here's the amount of testosterone they have, like, oh, 100,000 whatever is per unit of blood, and here's zero. Uh, and what they find is, you know, it's like this. Like, oh, look at that correlation, right? How would I find out if uh, these just happen to be correlated or they're causing one another? How could I find that out? How could I test it? Like, I looked and I can see it, but I don't know if I change the testosterone, does that change their behavior? How could I test that? Mm, it's less about the situation. You want to see if the testosterone changes their behavior. Like, we already know what they do. This guy is really likely to hit somebody if he's mad. This guy would never hit anybody, even if he was angry. All right? So we already know what they do in the situation. What we want to try to see is if this guy, we can make him less likely to hit somebody, or this guy more likely to hit somebody. How can we test that? We give the guy more testosterone? Yes. Okay. You could either uh, deprive people of testosterone or animals or you could give them testosterone, all right? And they do both, all right? So they have some instances where, uh, for mice, for example, they found that if they took really aggressive males that were over here in the spectrum, like they were very, very uh, willing to fight other mice, they got into more scuffles and things like that, however they defined it by biting or scratching or whatever. They're like, wow, these guys really bite and attack a lot of other mice. All right, let's measure their testosterone. Oh, their testosterone's higher than the other mice. All right, so like, how do we reduce this? So what they would do was they would take these mice that were super uh, aggressive and they'd castrate them, meaning they would surgically remove their testicles. All right, and that's, as far as I know, that's the only place where testosterone is produced uh, for males, at least. I think the female ovaries also do some testosterone, but you remove those, guys essentially have no testosterone. All right, so they uh, castrated the mice, put them back in the cage. Guess what they found out happened uh, after a few weeks went by and their hormones reached their new levels? Guess what happened to the mice? The really aggressive mice that are now castrated with no testosterone. Yeah, they, they, their violence, uh, their likelihood of being aggressive, aggressive dropped dramatically, right? They all of a sudden went from being up here to dropping their testosterone and oh, what do you know? They almost never got in fights after that. They became these docile, very harmless, uh, could easily be taken advantage of, uh, but uh, non-aggressive mice, all right? So could we test the reverse? Yeah. How can you test the reverse? <clears throat> what? Yeah, okay, you could take ones that are mid to low, or we'll just say low, for example, and jack up their testosterone, inject them, all right? So what do you think happened to the mice that were not doing anything aggressive before that they added a bunch of testosterone to? What do you think happened? They yeah, they became more aggressive. They've gotten into more fights and things like that, more scuffles, right? Uh, and that, that's exactly how you could test. And they've done this a bunch of times. A bunch of bands, they done it with bulls, they done it with people, they didn't castrate the people. But uh, they would take people that um, had lower high testosterone, they would inject them or they would prevent their, they would block their testosterone um, receptors because there are some drugs or chemicals that can, so if you look, if you zoom in on the cell, Right, you've got your X and Y chromosome, or your XXY, or whatever you got, whatever you are. It's got a bunch of receptors, right? Those can only turn on if a testosterone like pops on over and activates it, right? It's like a switch, kind of. Some medications, these are called antagonists, it's in the notes actually, uh, they can block it. They'll just, they'll, they'll walk up to the receptor, what was their shape, like this? They'll walk up to the receptor that's waiting for testosterone, and they'll be like, hello, and they'll just block this without activating it. So then testosterone comes up and it goes, oh, and it bounces off because it, it can't activate it. So they can give them chemicals or drugs that block these receptors, whether it's estrogen or, or testosterone or whatever. And the same thing happens. They give them the blockers, oh, the ones that were aggressive, oh, they uh, are now way less aggressive. Or the ones that give a bunch of extra testosterone, so it's activating way more of these, uh, that's going to make them a lot more aggressive. All right, so that can actually affect your behavior, even in, on like an instantaneous level which that's how they found it out. All right, so we know that your biology, like what goes into your body and, and what affects, uh, like your hormones, for example, that has a major impact 
on your actual uh, behavior. So how you physically develop and then what you do, what you like, how you think, and all of those things. All right. So it's going to get uh, more and more complex as we progress throughout the year. And we talk, we add emotion to it because we haven't talked about emotion yet. Uh, and we talk about the different regions of the brain communicating. But uh, hopefully this gives you a nice uh, understanding of the substructure uh, as far as how hormones, these little molecules that you can add or take away, uh, or your body naturally produces more of or less of, that can actually drastically impact how your brain develops uh, and how your body develops and what you do and think and, and like. You guys got that understanding? All right, sweet. So what I want you to know is uh, definitely know the roles for each, but I specifically want you to know how adrenal glands might affect your behavior, but certainly how they would affect your survivability. I want you to know um, how uh, testosterone and estrogen can affect your brain development, uh, even uh, your mathematical preference uh, inability, uh, and how it can affect your aggression, uh, how it can affect your uh, body size, muscle mass, um, uh, hair, body hair, things like that. Uh, those are the things I want you uh, uh, to know, like what they actually do. And for these bad boys up here, uh, just know their essential role as um, moderators of these individual uh, glands, or um, uh, in the case of the pituitary gland, the ones that can dictate what the other ones do. All right, they're all they're all important parts, and if any of these are malfunctioning, you're going to end up far different than um, somebody who has a typical average or normal or whatever um, uh, organ or, or DNA. <clears throat> Did we answer the location? Yeah, I uh, know the location of them, mm -hmm. roughly speaking. Just roughly. I mean, if you're saying the pancreas is down here, then I'm like, no. <clears throat> but as long as you got in the midsection, it's like above your stomach, under your lungs, in, in that area. Adrenal glands are kind of near your kidneys, as far as I know. They're they're tiny. Uh, thyroids are in your throat region, pituitary hypothalamus, and the center part of your brain. What else have we got? Oh, then the ovaries for women are, are a bit higher up, and then obviously for men, they actually dangle outside the body for the most part, uh, but that's roughly speaking where they are. So for women, you're looking here, for men, you're looking down there. <clears throat> All right, uh, so yeah, know that. And, and also don't forget the part two about how they're much slower to arrive, and they're much slower to leave. So if you ever go through hormone therapy, it's gonna take a while to see the effects of it, and if you stop it, it's gonna take a while for those effects to go away. Uh, and also, they can permanently change you, if you're, especially if you're developing. So if you uh, take a bunch of testosterone as you're growing up for whatever reason, it's actually gonna change the way your brain forms. Uh, it's gonna change the size and shape of your amygdala. It's gonna change the size and shape of the uh, various regions of your frontal lobe. Uh, it'll make you uh, bigger or smaller, because that's what makes you gain more muscle mass and size and things like that. So um, it, it'll drastically change. So hormone therapy or hormone exposure could actually permanently change some of your features, uh, but certainly they will in the short term. Uh, and again, uh, I want you to know how. In fact, why, don't you, why doesn't somebody tell me how these hormones actually do change you, your genes, your structure, or whatever? We'll go, we'll go parts, you don't have to explain the whole thing. Just explain to me a part of it and we'll all put it together and I'll give you Morgan Bucks for explaining your part. So let's start from one. I don't care which one you pick. Well, hell, let's just look at this, the sex hormones. Testosterone and estrogen. How would more or less these things actually change? I mean actually, mechanically in my body, how would they change me? I want the process. Testosterone makes me more aggressive. Okay, that's the effect, but I want to see what actually happens in my body to, to change whether it's my aggression or the, the structure, size, and preference of my uh, brain and body. So your cells have receptors. Okay, sweet. So you got cells, all right? And on the outside of them are receptors. There's a bunch of them, right? And there's receptors for different types of hormones and proteins and things like that. But some of them are uh, testosterone or estrogen receptors. Okay, that's step one. All right, what's next? So I've got receptors. Can these receptors take any hormone? No. What kind of hormones can they take? Well, it's specific, right? They only fit a certain shape, right? It's like, it's like those little toddler sets where they have like shapes like a star and a circle. It's like you can't shove the square into the star. It doesn't work. Right? It only fits if it's an actual star. All right? So I've got a bunch of receptors. Crickets. Oh, they can, but how am, I, how am I turning them on or off? Like, has to fit inside of the... Okay, sweet. So I got, uh, and there's a lot of factors here. 
if I have a lot more testosterone receptors than somebody else, I might respond differently because let's say I have only a tiny amount. Even if I have a bunch of testosterone, it doesn't matter. If I've only got a tiny amount of receptors, they can only do so much, right? So the amount of receptors can actually affect you and that's genetic, right? The amount of receptors you have that you're just granted at birth, like that, that's genetic. So that's how genes can actually affect this. Okay, so I got my, uh, I got my genes here, my chromosomes, right? And the different combinations they call alleles. So male XY. Female, I got an XX. Uh, intersex, I got XXY. But just, just know the difference there. That's female, that's male, that's intersex. All right. Okay, cool. So they float around, and uh, if it's a testosterone, it'll land right here, and that'll actually uh, engage different proteins and signals uh, to do different things. All right. Um, what's uh, changed here then? So these proteins are told to do something. What do they go do? Yes, right. So it signals these little proteins, those are the things in your, in your cells, but I forgot to mention this, that actually like go around and do stuff, turn things on or off or build or, or break down things. They're, they're, we, we actually don't really understand how they work because like each protein like has a job and it just goes and does that job. And it's like, what tells it to do the job? We don't know, but we know it does it. So <clears throat> um, at least as far as I know, we don't know. These proteins go over and they go and they turn off certain genes or alleles uh, or on, all right? And the different combinations that are on or off make my cells do different things. All right, that's how our genius expression uh, changes, right? That's why when you hit puberty, the major difference is your body gets flooded with, uh, with, with sex hormones, essentially. Your pituitary gland goes, all right, hey, look. It, it reads your DNA and says, okay, now we start puberty. And like age 12 or 13 or 14 or 15 or whatever, then your body goes, oh, and so sends the signal to the uh, ovaries, the testes, and they just go, okay, super testosterone production time, or super estrogen production, production time. And that's what's gonna initiate all these changes uh, in your actual body. Okay, sweet, so activate uh, receptors. They go over and they turn genes on or off. And then what do those genes do if they're turned on or off? What could they do? This is my blueprint, remember? How could this affect me as I'm developing? Got something? Um, no. They would dictate your either your appearance or your Yes. So it's going to actually dictate what's built and not built, or how much is built and how much is not built. So could that affect what parts of my brain develop more than others? It definitely could. Could it def uh, could it uh, change the amount of uh, growth hormones in my body and therefore the size of my muscle mass and body hair and bone size and density? Absolutely. Right. So that's what these things are doing. All right, so if I get a flood of testosterone, uh, I'm gonna develop a lot more uh, typically male uh, behaviors and appearances and sizes and preferences and things like that. Like, it, it'll change my gene expression, which will change how my body and brain are forming. Right, so then I'm in my brain, uh, let's say this is a typical male, boom, hit puberty, here's a flood of testosterone. Uh, all of a sudden my brain is going to develop things uh, differently than in a brain where I'm flooded with estrogen. All right, so it's gonna overdevelop or, or increase development in certain parts, underdevelop other parts, whereas the estrogen flooding brains are gonna develop a little differently, right? And that actually causes men and women uh, or people exposed to these hormones to actually think differently. Uh, and it specializes their brain uh, for different uh, skills or, 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 you know, various parts of intelligence or whatever it might be, right? Like spatial or arithmetic or whatever. Okay, and, and size too, right? That's how you uh, males uh, develop the typical uh, male body and females develop the typical female body uh, with like broader hips. Um, you, you develop, uh, men develop more uh, muscle mass in the upper body, women develop more body fat um, in like the breast region and whatnot. So that's, that's how this actually occurs over time, all right? Um, and then also, I think you mentioned this at the beginning, just the presence of a lot of testosterone itself actually changes my brain activity too. So if I have more testosterone, am I gonna be more or less aggressive? Mm. You're gonna be more likely to be more aggressive, right? So it can change the physical features of my genes and body, but it can also temporarily increase or, or change the activity in my brain to make me more aggressive or less aggressive, all right? So have an understanding of that process. So that's really important, because otherwise it's like, it doesn't mean anything to you. If you don't know how it actually works, I'm just telling you words that you're gonna forget. All right, so try to, as I go through this, this is the, the, the difference 
between me this year and you know, three or four years ago when I started is before I could just tell you what it was, like hormones change in behavior. Testosterone makes you more um, uh, aggressive or not aggressive, but you don't know why. <clears throat> this actually gives you a better understanding as to why. All right, so the presence of more testosterone in my brain, that's gonna make certain parts of my brain more active than others, which makes me more or less likely to be aggressive. Developmentally, it turns on and off certain genes, which changes how my brain develops or changes how my body develops. And it does that through these receptors. All right, can I block these receptors? Yes. I can, yeah. You can have um, antagonists that block these things out activating. Uh, for, uh, here's an example. My mom had breast cancer, but it was a type of breast cancer that was caused or worsened by estrogen. So like having estrogen in her body would activate these genes, which would send these proteins to tell uh, those cancer cells to replicate, like make too many, which would have inevitably killed my mom. So they caught it early. They got her on... Um, Chemotherapy, which kills fast-growing cells, not slow-growing cells, and cancer cells grow fast. So that's why you feel sick on chemo, um, but you don't die. Well, you would if you did too much or, or too often, but uh, they give you just enough poison to kill the fast-growing cells, which are the cancer cells, but, uh, and your hair, that's why your hair stops growing too, uh, but uh, your slow-growing cells, they're not really affected by it. So what they did was they killed off as many of those uh, cancer cells as they could with uh, radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, but there's still the problem of, well, you still got a bunch of estrogen, and the way your genes respond is, if you got a lot of estrogen, they're gonna uh, find these cancer cells you have and tell them to build way more of themselves way more quickly. So what do you think the doctors have my mom uh, doing now? She can't just do chemo all the time. So what do you think they have her on now? Not testosterone, good guess though. Is it just to do with the estrogen? Like, uh, something that, like, blocks yeah, exactly. So I'm not actually sure if it prevents her from producing estrogen or just blocks the receptors, but it does one of those two things. All right, so her medication either stops estrogen production, so now it's not as much of a chance of these cancer cells replicating because the uh, receptors aren't being activated and told to build more of themselves quickly. Uh, or it's blocking the receptors so they never get activated. Because remember, if you activate a receptor that tells a little protein to go over here and turn this on or off, and then that, that changes how your uh, cells actually behave. So if you were on a medication that's blocking the receptors, what would happen to the hormones? They wouldn't be there, but they wouldn't do anything. So if I blocked all of my estrogen receptors, uh, I could have a bunch of estrogen, wouldn't matter, because none of them can go in uh, and activate these cells. Uh, it might change my behavior, because it might actually um, change my, my, the chemistry in my brain, which would make me more likely to do things or not. But as far as the cells go and activating these uh, cancer cells, those receptors are blocked, so it wouldn't do anything. So hypothetically, my mom is much less likely to develop this again, uh, at least in the, in, the, in the short term. All right? But yeah, as we figure more of these things out, it, we understand more clearly how we develop, how diseases work, how we can stop them, how we can accidentally make them more likely to happen, and, and things like that. Oh, another one too, they figured out why vegan diets are best for fighting cancer. Uh, and the reason is, uh, and this is a personal choice, you don't have to do this <clears throat> if you don't want to, but the reason why uh, they found that if they put people on a vegan diet, which means you're eating no animal products, no eggs, no milk, no meat, or whatever, uh, for whatever reason, people recover from cancer at a much higher rate. They're like, why the hell is this happening? They didn't understand. They figured it out, though, they think. It's because when I uh, eat animal products, uh, so my mom's vegan now, by the way, because she wants to reduce the amount, the chances it's going to happen again. Um, <clears throat> animals have in them growth hormones, especially uh, dairy racing, because they want the cows to be bigger and to produce more milk, so they give them growth hormones to do that. So if I go and I eat the milk or the eggs or the uh, meat or whatever, I'm actually getting and ingesting growth hormones from animals, all right? So what that does is that puts in my bloodstream, what do you think it enters my bloodstream? Growth. More growth hormones, right. So I got a whole bunch of growth hormones coming in, more than I produce myself because I'm getting them from animal products or whatever. Uh, and <clears throat> what that does is that goes to cancer cells, which you may or may not have already, and it says, hey, we're growth hormones. We're gonna roll up, we're gonna hit the growth hormone receptor, and we're gonna tell you to produce faster and more and uh, give you more energy to do that. Uh, so those, uh, if I'm eating those animal products, 
and I have those cancer cells, they'll actually produce much more quickly, which means my body can't keep up with identifying them and killing them, because that's what your immune system does. Like, you have cancer cells right now, but your immune system is like floating around going, hey, 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 bad cell, and kills you, essentially. But if they're growing too quickly, and you don't have enough white blood cells or whatever to identify them and kill them, that's when you actually have uh, cancer spread. It ends up eventually killing you. So they actually found that when you uh, cut off these animal products and you cut off the growth hormones, uh, it makes your body much more uh, able to fight off uh, the growth of cancer cells. And they actually tested it too, like, okay, well maybe we're wrong. Let's just inject people with growth hormones in the blood and see if the cancer uh, uh, cells grow more quickly. And that's exactly what happened. They just took blood with cancer cells in it, put a bunch of uh, growth hormone in there, and the, the cancer cells built much more quickly much more rapidly. I saw pictures too, it was like, here's the one with growth hormone. And it was like, the dots for cancer cells are a whole bunch of dots. And it's like, here's the blood without the growth hormone. It was like, two. So it's like, oh, well that's definitely a contributing factor. So, hormones are super, uh, super important. They're slower, but they absolutely help determine who you are, cognitively, behaviorally, interest-wise, and, and body. So understand that. You know, I actually intended for the endocrine system to be like 20 minutes. It turned into like 90. Um, but hey, now you know. And, and that's what I want you to know. I want you to know how it actually works. Uh, that's going to help remember it much more uh, easily. Any questions about that?